Five Rings Podcast, Road to Tokyo on the Sport Podcasting Network. Your weekly fix leading up to the 2020 Olympic Games with Dwayne Rollins and Kevin Laramie. Follow us and listen to us live on Twitter at Five Rings Podcast and like our Facebook page, facebook.com forward slash Sports Podcasting Network for more content. Good day, good night, and welcome to the Five Rings Podcast, Road to Tokyo 2020. Today on the show, in our first show of 2020, it's an Olympic year, yes, we are in the same year as an Olympic Games, and Canada has qualified for the Games in volleyball, men's volleyball, and to talk about the qualifying tournament in Canada's trip to Tokyo this summer, joining us, half of the voices you could hear listening to the tournament last week, joining us, Gavin Day. Gavin, how are you doing today? I'm doing well, thanks for having me. Not a problem, Gavin. Uh, Gavin, I've known you for a few years now, but I always knew you as a soccer guy. But this volleyball passion is really, truly there. Tell us a little bit about why you love the sport so much and, and how you became such a advocate for volleyball. Uh, it's just one of those things that, that sort of stuck with me. I mean, ever since I was a kid, I've I, I've really played all kinds of sports, and, and, and volleyball is one of them. And, you know, did it through high school. I actually did. Uh, some referee training years ago and uh, and that just sort of continued it's just you know it's always been a sport of you know continued watching it's always a top one every four years that that I really get into both it on the beach and then the beach version watching all of it and so um, yeah it's just one of those things that that sort of sticks with you and it's it's one of the top spectator sports in the Olympics every four years for a reason and it's it's just something I can I can sort of watch it you know non not non-stop but it's just one of those things I can really get into and um, it's just one of those infectious kind of international sports that that's a joy to watch uh, Gavin in the 2015 Pan Am Games room in Toronto I watched more volleyball than anything else and you're right it's absolutely thrilling to watch the beach game has you know aesthetics that make it popular but the court game the indoor game is is so fast and so wonderful i had the opportunity to watch brazil play argentina in the pan games in 2015 and with the color in that arena it was for 10 bucks or something it cost me to get in i you know best value in toronto and, but yet you know people can only talk about the plb lanes but that's a different topic for another day um why isn't the sport more popular in north america because it is exciting and it is fast in your mind why is it not more popular and do you think it never will be that's the mystery. It's one of those sports that, that once you see it, you, you know, you're immediately kind of transfixed by it. And, uh, you know, it sort of feels like one of those sports that, you know, it's, it's, it's really just played in gym class growing up in, in elementary school and in high school. But, um, you know, there's no pro league. And unlike the rest of the world where there are, you know, leagues in, in countries around the world. And I think it's just the, the different culture where, you know, at some point, people I think are supposed to stop playing the game and that's just not the case in a lot of places in the world. And so, um, you know, until there's a day where it is one of those things where, where, where more people's eyes are open to it and, and it's something that, uh, you know, people sort of realize it's, it, it's not just a sport you play at a certain age. Uh, that's just, that's just the way it's going to be. Looking at this qualifying tournament with Canada, getting a ticket to Tokyo 2020, can you explain to us before the tournament where Canada was ranked in the world ranking and and what were their their probabilities of making this tournament and how it unfolded? Yeah, I mean Canada was expected to qualify out of this one at least for the men's for the men's tournament. Uh, it's sort of the 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 untold secret of Canadian sports that this program is is right around the elite in the world. They're ranked number seven. Uh, they're, they're, I wouldn't say they're quite there in terms of, of being among the top teams. They they can consistently keep it close with the occasional win, but they're by no means sort of consistently beating beating the top teams. But they're they're just a step or two behind. But uh, you know this tournament against Cuba, Puerto Rico, and Mexico, Canada was still expected to do it. Uh, the only the only real challenge was coming from a hard charging Cuban team that is one that's that's sort of regaining some lost glory because um, Canada got to host the tournament by virtue of of uh, failing to qualify at an event last year in China another sort of similar four person tournament so the the fact 
that they qualified wasn't a surprise. It was just, uh, you know, the uh, the Cuban matchup was was absolutely something I'll never forget, and it was it was quite intense. When we look at the volleyball Canada and the team going to represent Canada at the Tokyo 2020 Olympic Games, which standout would you tell us to keep an eye on? I know Ban is really popular, but outside of him, who in this team is their superstar, you would say? Well, that is the kind of the strength is that, that there are guys who, who are attracting the strength. A guy like Shawan Vernon Evans is, is the the young talent with, with all kinds of attention, but uh, he, you know, he, he didn't have the strongest qualifying tournament. The, what the strength in the Canadian is that Canadian team is that there is, is depth. And on any given night, a different guy can step up. We, we saw against Cuba, the likes of, you know, Gord Perrin and Nick Hogue, uh, Dan Jansen, Van Dorn, and some of the more veteran guys, step to the side and let guys like Ryan Slater and Arthur Schwartz come out and have absolutely monster nights. So there are guys that, that they will turn to uh, and the sort of, and lead things off, but, but there's no sort of true big star, uh, which I think, you know, sort of is Canada's strength because it, it, it means there's fewer ego. There's, there's, there's less ego. There's less of a, uh, of a guy who's craving the spotlight. Gavin, after a hundred-year gap, was a winning a, a team medal. Canada has now uh, gotten team medals, three of them in the last two Olympics. Um, you were around that 2012 women's team uh, uh, quite a bit. You know them very well. You know sort of what the mentality was coming in. I'm talking about soccer here. Uh, is there any similarities between this and that team? You know, you think seventh ranked in the world, uh, there might be a chance for some kind of miracle run to uh, to grab a bronze or something like that. Do you, do you see any similarities there? It's, I mean, it's possible. I mean, in the last cycle, they've beaten the men's, this men's volleyball team has beaten Brazil. Uh, you know, they're, they're, like I said, they're right up there. They can occasionally get the, the result. Um, it, it would have to take, you know, I still think a lot for it to, to, for it to go their way and for them to sort of enter that, that picture of reaching the semifinal. But, you know, four years ago, they, uh, they lost to Russia in a quarterfinal and, um, you know, on, on a day, Russia is a beatable team, the likes of the U.S. or Italy or France. Um, so uh, a, lot of, a lot of cards would have to fall away. We still have to see what group they're going to end up in. But, um, you know, it, it's possible. I'd say it's improbable. But, you know, these, these events happen for a reason. And four years ago, Canada, they immediately turned some heads by, by showing up and, and beating the U.S. So you can really never say never. Fair enough. Well, let's expand the, the conversation to the world a little bit. Um, tell us a bit about the very top programs and what makes them special. Well, I mean, look no further than uh, than Brazil, the the defending Olympic champions. Um, you know, as much as soccer is part of that Brazilian culture. Uh, you know, indoor volleyball is is I wouldn't say as big, but it's. It's right up there. Uh, you look at four years ago, and it's uh, it was a you know a must attend kind of event where uh, you know it was packed and it was intense, and uh, you know they are still you know so you know one would argue the the gold standard, but uh, it, France I think is another team which is, I don't I don't know what's just missing from it, but it has enough talent to to perhaps make a run at something and. Um, you know, you look at the, the Frances and the Polands and the Italys and the Russias of the world, and, and they all have strong, robust professional leagues that, that, that everybody else in the world wants to play in. And, you know, they, they draw pretty good crowds. And, um, you, you know, it's, you wouldn't, of course, you know, the, that soccer is the, uh, is the cultural event in a lot of these countries, but, you know, volleyball is, it, it's, it might not be a strong second or a strong third, but it's but it's right up there, and it's it's really part of the sporting infrastructure. Leading up to Tokyo 2020, what is the practice time for the volleyball teams? Any tournament, running up tournament, or maybe even practice tournament heading into the Olympic Games this summer? Yeah, well, I mean, most of them would be will be playing in the in the nations league, which uh, you know it's a it's sort of a marathon international event where you're on the road 
just about every weekend in May and June. Um, and it's you're, you're playing just about a lot of these same teams. Now, the big question is uh, how seriously you're going to take that one because uh, you're going – uh, all over the world, uh, and the, the travel mileages really add up, and, and you have to really wonder how much you're willing to risk for it. It is a pro, it is a tournament, it's an annual, it's the biggest international annual competition, and it, there is some relegation involved for for some of the teams. So you know, it's a team like Canada, if they you know really lay an egg in this tournament, they could get relegated down to the challenger level, and that could affect you know, who you're playing or you're playing the best of the best in this tournament. So you look at Canada, they go from in, in consecutive weekends, they're in the U S Italy, Slovenia, Japan, and Canada. So, uh, how, how are you much are you willing to risk your guys on a consecutive basis as you head into a tournament in the end of July? And, uh, as preparation goes, that's the big one, but, but you're not sure, uh, you're probably going to want to rotate guys in and out of that tournament. Tactically speaking, heading into the Olympic Games, knowing that you're qualified at this point, is there time for Volleyball Canada to rest up, maybe heal a bit, like you mentioned, a little bit of load management coming into the Nations League, not the A lineup that will travel all around the world? Is there a tactical aspect also that maybe not give your best look to your opponent that you might face in the Olympics in the Nations League and also maybe finding ways to develop strategies heading into the fast-paced, but, yeah, very big international Olympic tournament for volleyball this summer. Yeah, I'm not sure how much you can keep secret from your opponents. You, They face each other enough, and there's enough sort of intel out there that, that there's not a lot different you can bring. Um, the big thing, I think, is is the rest and, and preparation. You know, the, the program is will be is based in, in Gatineau, just outside of Ottawa. They have a full-term, you know, full-time training center there. Uh, so when the guys' club seasons wrap up as we get closer to the summer, uh, you can imagine that they'll base themselves there, and then it's all just to t- determine on how they they design the, the preparation. So you can imagine that once the club season ends, They'll give their players as much rest as they can to be healthy for Nations League and, and however else they uh, they design their training program. I mean, you, I, you can expect to see some of the top players in some of the Nations League games, just uh, not every weekend. So, uh, you know, they'll look at how the seasons will wrap up uh, the closer we get to the summer, at least from the club side of things. And then, uh, I, you know, I would imagine they'll centralize and, and, and design based on how, what condition their guys are in, uh, who's healthy, who, who could use some rest going into the, the international calendar. Now, just before we say goodbye, Gavin, looking at the women's side, is there any big tournament? And when will we know if Canada qualifies on the women's side also? Uh, well, Canada, they had the same qualification tournament on the same weekend. They had their last chance tournament, just like the men. They were in the Dominican Republic. Uh, they went down one win and two losses uh, in Santo Domingo. They beat Mexico on the last day, but had already lost a, a five-set heartbreaker to Puerto Rico, and then and then they lost in four sets to the Dominican Republic. So that cycle is over for them. However, they uh, they're in Nations League as well, and it's the the top level, they're in the, they're in the top Nations League event. It's sort of a, a tiered system where there's there's promotion and relegation between the challenger level. So just last year, uh, Canada's women's team, they, they won the challenger level and have won promotion to the Nations League for the first time. So despite failing to qualify for Tokyo, they are still somewhere they've never been before. They up are, they are up amongst the, the best in the world in playing in this Nations League. So they're going to get a higher competition. This The, the team had, uh, coached by Tom Black, who also coaches the University of Georgia women's team, will have Canada playing some very top competition this summer. And as they, they look to begin a new cycle and moving towards 2024, these, these kinds of games are, are what will help you know, the, the program helped continue those steps and closing the gap between themselves and, and those top teams in Norseka that have that have qualified for Tokyo. Well, hopefully we see them in Paris. Gavin, before we let you go, can you give us any shiny light on the beach program? Anything exciting coming from there? Well, of course, you have to look on the women's side with, uh, you know, the world champions already qualifying with uh, Sarah Pavin and Melissa Humana-Paradis. 
you know, in Hamburg winning the world championships last year. I've actually been, I actually was at a, uh, a couple of years ago, I was in Hamburg when it was just a, a world tour stop and it's a, it was a fun event, but um, yeah, so they became the first team to, to book their ticket with uh, that world championship win. And that's massive when so many of the other teams are fighting for qualification spots based on their world ranking. So, uh, and the, even then the other Canadian team on the women's side looking for qualifying is uh, 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 Brandy Wilkerson, and uh, Heather Bansley, Bansley Pavin's former teammate, they're also, you know, a regular, maybe not on the podium, but close to it. So two top women's teams. And as we get close to the Olympics, presuming Bansley and Wilkerson get in, having those two top teams make a run uh, for a podium spot is, would be unprecedented for the women's program. The men's program, they should still get, you know, at least one team in, uh, not quite as, as far along as, as the women's beach teams are, but, uh, Considering how popular the how how sort of beach volleyball is one of those sports that gets rediscovered every four years, uh, the two <laughs> top Canadian women's teams will be getting plenty of airtime come this summer. Gavin Day, thank you very much for your time today. You can follow Gavin on Twitter at Gavin L Day to be able to follow his work and know when you can hear him and see him next time. Gavin, we thank you for your time today, and we hope you have a great lead up to Tokyo 2020. Thanks for having me, guys. And we'll be right back after this short break. And we're back on the Five Rings Podcast. Kevin Larmate with Dwayne Rollins, as always. And Dwayne, talking about volleyball, getting ready for Tokyo 2020, Canada qualifying. It does feel like an Olympic year now. For, for sure. And look, uh, I, we're, we try to be an international show, but who we are Canadian, we don't hide that. And one of the most exciting things about this whole mix for me is just the sheer amount of Canadian teams that have qualified. That is unprecedented. Um, not in every sport yet, of course. That's no nation other than the U.S. Really, I mean, the U.S. even they don't qualify for handball. Uh, they, you know, it's it's hard to go there, but uh, it's exciting. That I'm glad to see because Gavin said volleyball is one of those sports that I think everyone rediscovers every four years, not just on the beach side. The beach side is, you know, perfect TV for for lots of reasons. Yeah, let, let's them, let's be honest here. We usually call things like we see it here. There's for both men and women. Usually, beach volleyball athletes are good looking, and at least they don't wear a lot of clothes on TV. Also, so there's viewership that comes from from that segment of society. For, for sure, and look, I, it's exciting sport too on its own. I I, I watched several uh, in 2015. I watched several of, uh, sessions of that, and I got to tell you that it, it is incredible to see live, as Gavin said. But the I, the court game is even faster and even more exciting. Yeah, it's violent. An opportunity to watch. Like people don't realize how violent it is. Like to receive that ball on your face in a smash, it, it, it is quite fast-paced, violent, and intriguing also. No, you're right. We rediscover it every four years, and it's going to be a fun tournament. No, precisely. And look, seventh ranked in the world is unprecedented for the Canadian volleyball team, and it's pretty impressive when you consider what Gavin said about there not being a pro league here, or even like the Hanto one. It reminds me a lot of soccer in the 90s in this country where – like after the KPL or not the KPL, the CFL uh, folded and everyone going, oh, well, this is just, just not a pro sport anymore and there's no chance for it to ever happen. And like it, it really held you back as a, as a nation. But that said, you know, the fact they have a, a, set, a place that they go, a training center, and they're able to get up to seventh in the world and the Canada's qualifying for so many teams now speaks to the to the funding and the attention well, that they've gotten through. It's not called on the podium on the summer side, but that's just called on the podium for, well, for lack of a better way to play. There, and, there's a, and there's other organizations like B210 and, and these private organizations that does create funding. Once you get the seventh in the world, you're actually li- eligible to these type of fundings also because a lot of times fundings are given to only elite programs or programs that are in top 10 in the world and have a chance for medals. That's the basic way Canadian athletes at the highest level of the Olympic sports do get more and more funding depending on the performances too. Being top 10 in the world does make at least the return phone call from corporate sponsors a bit quicker and sometimes they they actually sign the checks. Yeah, and 
you know, the grant programs, there's a, a program where they give a evolving athletes. I think it's like $5,000 every four months or so, which doesn't sound like a lot, but it can make a huge difference when you're on a C card or something for the Olympic funding and, and only getting like 20,000 a year. So, you know, another 5,000 is going to pay for groceries, right? Uh, it's a tough slug. That's just one of the reasons I love watching these, these athletes as much as we can get caught up in all the negativity around the Olympic movement with the IOC and drugs and all that sort of stuff. And we can, and we talk about that in the show. I think one of the reasons I stick with it and one of the reasons I will always defend the ideals of the Olympic movement is because it's about mostly young people, you know, horse jumpers can be a little older and <laughs> archers and stuff like that, but mostly young people chasing dreams for not a lot of glory. And there's something inherently charming and exciting and fun about that that i love to watch and you know wouldn't you love to be see one of those canadian beach volleyball teams go on a run and be in a gold medal game and suddenly everyone's talking about them for a couple weeks they deserve that if that happens and i'm sure that's exactly what would happen if the canadian women's volleyball team plays for a gold medal you guarantee yeah. there will be two million people watching that game on on tv when it happens right it's unfortunate that the woman didn't qualify for the uh, indoor volleyball tournament but let's just look at the men's side volleyball tournament gavin mentioned a few names here and of course brazil famously won four years ago the men's tournament indoors and of course a perennial favorite heading into tokyo also but i love the volleyball tournament i, I do love in my olympic watching and if you've been with us for a few olympic cycles you know that Dwayne and i Go daily during the Olympic Games. Yeah, daily with this show. Usually like an hour every day. Breaking down and giving medals. That's what we do. And I really enjoyed the 2016 volleyball tournament. I love the multi-day story narrative that a multi-day tournament does have at the Olympics. It's all well and good, the 50 meters swimming competition. In 10 seconds, it's over and you have a medal. But there's something about the long-lasting tournaments, the soccer tournament, the volleyball tournament, handball tournament, these longer-lasting tournaments at the Olympics that gather momentum. You see some some underdog stories, some Cinderella stories. You have some, some unexpected results. And there's something about these long tournaments during the Olympics. I think if you go back and listen in our archives that the Brazilian men winning the Olympic gold was one of our overall medals for the games. So one of our top three moments of the entire games, I do believe that was part of it. And, and just, you just mentioned it, it brought back the memory of that. It was such an insane, intense crowd and they wanted it so bad. It was such an exciting moment. And, you know, I think the gold medal I gave was uh, the, the, um, a uh, taekwondo uh, woman from Brazil, from the from the slums of Brazil, Rio, that won. If you remember that, and we been in the crowds. Yeah. Anyway, the Rio Games had some great moments, didn't they? And I can't wait to find out what the great moments in Tokyo are going to be. The, yeah, and we don't have to wait that long to find out. We only have to, what we're six months away, pretty much right now. So yeah, it's gonna go quickly. Yeah, and there'll be better weather at the time too. But yeah, no, I'm I'm excited by by all these team sports. You know. The, I got it. It gets the team sports. You're right. It's great. There's something about the the longness of it. The how like how much it involves and it evolves uh, over the course of the week. You know, the famous one here for us is the women's soccer, uh, especially in London, because that was a story that started before the actual game started, because they play their first game a couple days before the opening ceremony, and just kept growing and growing and growing and. and you know, ultimately ended with on the last day with a bronze medal, and that's I think it was the last day of competition at any rate, maybe the last or second last, and and it was just such a great moment that ultimately led to, you know, one of the things that I think broke soccer into the mainstream to stay in this country. Like, there's no doubt that it is now. I used to debate this: when will soccer make it? I know it always comes back to soccer for us, but. Forgive me, I live yeah, it. We, we, we apologize. We, we have five hours on air a week of soccer. So sometimes <laughs> we, we, we just need to talk more about soccer. Yeah, but what I'm, what I'm getting at is how it builds and builds and builds. Even let's go to winter games for a second, like a curling tournament, for instance. Hockey That's curling. That, yeah. yeah, hockey curling. Everyone watches it every day. And, and it's, you know, you start to, you know, understand and appreciate the, uh, the, the athletes. Um, it's the, in, the, in Pyeongchang, I think the, uh, the team that I appreciated the most was that mixed doubles team in, in, in curling for Canada because it was like a sport I wasn't that familiar with. I'm familiar with curling, but not that format. And we knew both of the athletes coming in. Uh, 
but yeah. just they got Rachel Holman, bad. Rachel Holman, yeah. and uh, what's his face? The the the, the, uh, the, the guy next Trump. door. You know, what's his face? Yeah, yeah, I should know him. Went to the lawyer. But- the guy who looks like my neighbor. Yeah, exactly. But, but no, you're right. And I think it, there's there's also an aspect where these tournaments, and let's just use uh, the summer examples here because we're going to talk. We're talking about Tokyo. So the volleyball tournament, the soccer tournament, both men and women. On the, in this case, the volleyball tournament, handball. These daily occurrence of Olympic games that happen every day, volleyball games and all. It's like the they are part of the overarching environment or consumption of the game because we do it on a daily basis. And the rest is filled by, by other events, plugging here, swimming, of course, athletics and, and combat sports. And you have the tennis tournament, which is another example of, of tournaments that are fun. But it feels like it, it furnishes, if you understand my use of the word, our, our programming schedule of the Olympics. And it taints our overall experience in a good way, I, look, I think so. It, well, yeah, If you're unless you're watching OTT, which increasingly we want more often uh, to get the exact sports we want. When you're on a network, <laughs> the team competitions are basically filler, right? When they don't have anything else to throw on. All right, let's cut to volleyball and watch Cuba play Romania. Why not? <laughs> you get to see a bit more of it. I kind of want to watch Cuba Romania now. And by the way... We didn't talk about it today. Right now, it is a youth Olympic and the winter sports. You can look on the Olympic channel on YouTube, live coverage every single day. Dwayne and I are starting to look at things. We're a couple days behind, but we'll talk about it next week on the Five Rings Podcast Road to Tokyo 2020. And once again, thanks to Gavin for his time today. You can follow Gavin at Gavin L. Day. You can follow Dwayne on social media at 24th Minute and myself at Kev Laramie. We'll be back next week with another edition of the five rings podcast a road to tokyo and this time we'll look at the youth olympic going on right now in switzerland but as always until next week enjoy your youth olympic and on your podium folks <laughs>